Well, uh, hello. Oh, that's loud. What a nice well, welcome. Well, uh, very, very, very nice. Very nice to, to see you all. Uh, welcome to the 92nd Street Y and to my um, honored, esteemed friend and guest, Ben Platt. Um, this, um, uh, this is very special for me. I, I don't know how many of you were at Radio City Music Hall the other night. So I don't know about you, but I have not recovered yet. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm serious. I, I don't know when I've had an experience like that um, anywhere. Um, and so tonight, I want to engage in a, in a dialogue with all of us um, that really talks about not just what Ben has accomplished, um, but also who he actually is and what he brings. And there's somebody who once said to me, there's nothing to get in life. There's only what you give. And he is the personification of that for me. And so I would like to speak to a lot of those kinds of things tonight. So the credits are the credits. We know there's the Tony and the Emmy and the Grammy and the, yeah. <laughs> we, and, and times uh, 100 most influential people at the age of 23 <laughs> and the Drama League uh, youngest um, recipient of the Drama League Award uh, for performance. Usually you have to have a lifetime of uh, experience. Uh, he got it. Um, he's the youngest recipient to get the Drama League Award. So, it, yeah, I mean, a, a feel, listen, all through, this, all through this dialogue, please feel free to just stop and scream and yell and clap. <laughs> I mean, this is, about, this is about a person who I experience as one of the freest people I have ever met. And so I want you to feel that for yourselves as well tonight. Um, so here's the... The, the thing that I want to speak to, um, God, I feel like Barbara Walters. Um, <laughs> um, um, You're better than Barbara Walters. Oh, honey, thank you. Well, the hair is better at any rate. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm so happy to see you. I'm so happy to see you. Oh, I'm my. happy to have an excuse to hang out with you. I know, this is so good, but we're going to get a chance to hang out next season when Quite we start bit. shooting <laughs> The Politician. <laughs> just remarkable in the show. It's really, it's quite a, quite a uh, tour de force. Anyway, um, so the, um, I, wanna, I wanna begin at the beginning. I wanna talk about um, your family. I wanna talk about Los Angeles. I wanna talk about when you knew that you were interested in music or that you had the voice that you have. So sp speak to some of that. Sure, I, so I was born in 93. Uh, in Los Angeles, woo, 93? Um, <laughs> no, not 93. <laughs> That's right, honey, 49, and you can do the math. Um, and I was number four of my siblings. I had three older siblings that were already walking the earth. Right. Um, and I was born into a house filled with show tunes all the time. My parents, that was just the bread and butter of not only like what did we play in the car or what did we play in the home, but like the trivia games we play on vacations, the jokes, the inside jokes with the family, everything really was based in entertainment in general, but very specifically musical theater. That's what we all bonded over. And we all went to the same program called the Adderley School growing yeah. up, where you do like once a week rehearsals on Wednesdays, uh, Wait, some, how old are you at this point? I started that at, at six. Or, Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> and all of my siblings had done it before me, so I was just raring to get in there, but the oldest you could be in the class was six, and I had to wait till I was six. And then you do, you could do like 12 weeks uh, rehearsing for some like truncated version of a classic, and then you do like two performances for the parents, and then you move on to the next one. And I, all my siblings loved it, of course, but I became really infatuated with that program and that was what I looked forward to in my week most, more than anything was. What was it about that? When you say infatuated, that's such a powerful word. What is that, what do you mean? I think I felt sort of a little bit aimless in other parts of life. I think I felt like I had all of this energy and all of this like weird desire to be
be the center of attention and to make people laugh and to to do something and, and it just didn't make sense to do that like at Shabbat dinner or, you know. <laughs> that would be unfortunate. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I put on plays in the backyard and also my living room had a great curtain that you could uh, like w open by going like this and I thought that was very cool. So Did I they do that on purpose? Your N no, parents? No. But it, I, that you was know, to me it was. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, I think I just got bit immediately and wanted to do as many as they would allow me to fit in one year, many, as many of those shows. and. Mm -hmm. The friends that I made there were my favorite friends because they were just as expressive and strange and m musical theater obsessed as I was and they just wanted to talk about the show and talk about the costumes and talk about how excited we were for it and it was just, I don't know, it was, uh, it was such a way to focus every part of myself into one thing that I felt like I really could do. What was, that, what was the aimlessness about? What did you, what was that experience? I think I just didn't know like what my tribe was, um, like I think uh, like my sister was in like brownies and, and like my brother was a really like an athlete and my oldest sister was like really, really intelligent, really smart, had a lot of friends at school. And I think I, you know, I did fine socially, but I didn't, ha I couldn't find like the like-minded people. And as soon as I w walked into a theater class or any kind of theater yeah. setting, it was like, oh, these are my, these are my people. Yeah, I had, I had that experience too. And then after Adderley, mm -hmm. you went to Harvard Wesley. Well, first I, so I, uh, because of Adderley, uh, the, when I was nine, which is when I started in the biz properly. Um, yes, the, you uh, did a tour. I, well, first I did the, you know the bowl does like a summer musical every yeah, summer, right. Hollywood Bowl. So the first time they ever did that, it was the Music Man. And they came to my program, the casting director, and they asked uh, Janet, who's the head of our program, if they had any kids they wanted to send in. And she sent a couple of us, and, and she said to my parents, like, I really think, He's got an affinity for it. He should let him try and audition for Winthrop. And I was all about it. I was gung ho. I really wanted to do it. And then, of course, the night before, I like freaked out and cried and mm -hmm. I told my parents, "Don't make me do this." And I think they could tell that it was like a last-minute defense mechanism, and that I really did want to do it. I just was really scared, and they encouraged me to go. And they both went with me. And as soon as I went into the room, I was like, "Oh, this is you know." <laughs> 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 and you were smoking at nine. Exactly. Okay, uh huh. Good. Uh -huh. That's good. None Start of you do that. Don't anybody do that. Um, um, yeah. But but that that's so interesting that you say that about your parents, mm -hmm. that they knew that it was just a last minute defense mechanism. Yeah. Your father is Mark Platt, very well known producer, La La Land, and, and yes, you know, and yes, La La. Yes, I mean, very very generous, warm, loving, amazing man, wicked, uh, oh, hello. Um, Mary Poppins uh, Returns, yeah. Into the Woods, the adaptation of the film. Right. I mean, he knows what he's doing. He's, he's yeah, he's, he's, he's okay. He's done well for himself, right. let's yeah. just say. <laughs> what do you think it was about him relating to you that he knew that about you? That both of them knew that about you? I think they saw how much I loved it. They saw that I spent all my afternoons in my backyard putting on shows and with my boom box and singing through cast albums and recognized that I was much like him. And he, when he was growing up, he did the same thing. He'd put on productions in his backyard and really? make, makeshift sets. And I think they just saw that in me and knew that when I was the most alive and the happiest and the most focused, it was all when I was doing that. And there was no denying that. Even if there was momentary fear or you know doubt, I think they, they could see that not only did I have a love and a passion for it, but I really had an ability to back it up. And I think that made it very easy for them to support me because they knew I could really give it a shot. Did your siblings notice that in you too? Did, was there any competition among you? Not really. I mean, I think everybody kind of had a different lane. We all sing and we all love theater socially and everybody did it in high school. And Do your folks sing? Yes, both, both sing. Both sing, and I thought for a really long time that mostly that it was my, my father really was like the main singer, and that, that he's kind of where we mostly got it from, because my mother has a lovely voice now, but she keeps it very soft, and she doesn't let us hear it that often. And then when I was 14 years old, my dad played me a recording of my mom singing in college, and it is so crazy how much better she is than him. Like, she's, <laughs> she's like Karen. She's not here tonight. No. So Karen Carpenter, like gorgeous voice. I have it on my phone. I listen to it all the time whenever I need. Really? Like, yeah. It's she just she was incredible. I mean, it's all her. Um, I got a lot of really important things from my dad too, but the singing is is Julie. Um, really? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's so, so interesting. So everybody sang, but no, nobody was as I think driven about this particular career as as I was. Now after the fact, my my brother, my older brother, is in the biz too. He's Jonah. a comedian and writer. He acts. He does musical theater as well. Um, but as far as that very specific one track mind, that was, that was only me. 
And then after that, after the Hollywood Bowl, there was Caroline and or Change, the tour of that, did that come out, that came right after that, yes. right? I did, I did a couple of the Bowl musicals. They happened to keep doing shows that had a kid in them. So I did like Young Patrick and Mame, and I was one of the Von Trapp kids in Sound of Music. And Don't they call your family the Von Platts? Von Platt family singers. Yeah. <laughs> right. And we earned the title, let me tell you. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then uh, the, the same situation where the casting director came to Janet from my program and said, we're, we're, we're doing Carolina Change just in LA and San Francisco. And I don't know if anyone has seen Carolina Change, but it's a gorgeous, gorgeous. piece of theater. Gorgeous. Uh, it's Tony Kushner and Janine Tesori and, and George Wolf. And they were bringing the whole original cast, except the, the kid had gotten too tall and too old. So they needed just an, all they needed was a new little Jewish boy, much to my luck. Um, <laughs> And the kid who actually I re ended up replacing, his name's Harrison Chad, and we've become really good friends as adults now, which is sort oh. of strange and funny. Um, but I went in for Janine and George and got the role and did it in the two cities, and it was wonderful. And for how long? Like, I think four months in LA, and I stayed in school during that, and then I left wow. school for, for one semester to do it in San Francisco. I missed the second half of sixth grade. Um, but I came back in time to play Muddle and Fiddler at the program. Thank God. <laughs> There's this Jewish theme that keeps running through your... Well, throat. look where we are. Uh, and hello. I mean, I mean, that's what you said before we came here. <laughs> exactly. And Happy New Year to those of Shana you. Shana Tova. Oh, my God. All right. All right. And but if they're not Jews, they're at least allies, because they're here. That <laughs> that's, ex that's exactly right. But the, um, and then tell me what happened at 12. It's a story that you talk about. Um, you talked about it in your show at Radio City, and it was so in infinitely charming. Well, thanks. I'll tell it again. Get, Would you get, please? Get, if you heard it, too bad. <laughs> um, so I um, basically figured that I wanted to be in love with men and only men from like as soon as I was able to figure that out. I mean, I think even before it was like a sexual adult thing, it was How like, old were you? Uh, I mean, I was 12 when I decided to talk about it with everyone, but right. as long as there's been any thing in my mind about anyone romantic, it was always men. And it was more so like, like a fun home ring of keys kind of moment where it's like, I just recognized myself in all these people because my dad is in the business, so I was around all sorts of gay, I mean, especially in the theater. Theater is like 90% gay men. Uh, right. So I'm, I was just around them all the time and I was like, oh, that's, I'm like that. That's, I identify with that. Even before it was like an adult, really actualized sexual. There's thing. my other tribe. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like I, this are the, this is the tastes that I would like to have. Um, and so I didn't really feel the need to discuss it until I was on this trip to Israel in, in, in eighth grade. Um, and was it birthright? Did you do birthright? It was, it was like birthright, but I was at a Jewish day school, so it's like just my day school taking us on like a similar birthright-ish trip. It's like a, a ten. day school took you to Tel Aviv? They did. <laughs> they took us to Tel Aviv in Jerusalem. We did an exchange where we had a student that would come and spend um, a month in, in L.A. and live with our, like a host families. No kidding. And then we all lived with host families there. Oh, how fabulous. It was awesome. Oh, my and God. Far, fabulous. far too unsupervised. Like, <laughs> we were let free. I mean, that's kind of the M.O. in Israel is like, do you? You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so that's that's where you got it. Now I know. Yeah. Okay, now I know where you're from. So we're on this trip, and this kid. Uh, it was like one of the first experiences I'd had, where like we were all going through puberty, and like the girls and the guys were being weird to each other and hanging out in different groups, and it was just those dynamics all starting to come into play. And I was always hanging out with the girls because that's those were my buddies. I was those were my friends. That's who I connected with. And this kid made this comment on the bus. He was like, oh, Ben's so lucky, he's gay. He gets to hang out with all the girls. They don't care. They let him like chill in their rooms with them, and he gets to be close to them and whatever. And it truly was not derogatory in any way. It was just like completely true. Like that's, those were my friends. That's what I was doing. <laughs> um, but our uh, Miss Molitz, who was the principal and the chaperone, overheard the kid and was going to get him in trouble and wanted to get my parents involved. And I was like, this is not the way that I want this to go down because this is, I don't want the first time we talk about this to be because of like a pseudo bullying incident that wasn't even a bullying incident. Right. So I went home to the hotel in Tel Aviv and I called them, um, for, I don't know what hour, and I said, I have to tell you something. I got on the phone and I, I never call my parents and say like, I have to tell you something. Mm. So as soon as I said that, my mom was like, oh, this is about your sexuality. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so she was totally tuned in she to you. Knew, they both knew. And I was like, yes. And, and she was like, first of all, you're very young, and if you decide to change your mind, that's fine. But, for, but we know, and you know, you were dressed as Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz from, for most of your childhood, and you know. Here's a big clue. That's a huge clue. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, she was Friend like, I have Dorothy. lots of books I've been reading, and I'm gonna read more of them. And she'd been preparing for it, and my dad was also like, you're, we love you, and as long as you're okay with it. Like, and they asked me if I was being safe, and I was like, I don't know what that means. I'm 12. <laughs> <laughs> I 
think I'm being safe. Um. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Like, well, it was the question of the time. Yeah, of course. Of I mean, course. and everybody was asking that question. And I they mean, still you know, do. They, I mean, you of know. Course, they still ask you? Um, of course, everybody. I mean, that's, you know. That's no, but do your parents still ask you? Oh, no, no, no. That's, oh, I was going to say. <laughs> no. So they stay out of that stuff. All they ask me is, is he Jewish? <laughs> and I say to them, as long as he's open to Judaism, that's all that matters. Okay. <laughs> And would he convert? Exactly. That's all you have to know. Exactly. Right? Could, could the children go to summer camp? That's, That's exactly asking. right. <laughs> exactly. Kosher summer camp. Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Indian Lake, Poconos. Just uh -huh. saying. Poconos. Uh -huh. Yep, you got it. Okay, so you come out to them, and then what happens after that? What's the progression of that? And then it just became a really assumed part of reality. I think telling my siblings was the only weird thing because why? I don't know. Talking about anything like sexual or romantic with siblings is always weird because it's like your your buddies in such a different way. And I, I'm an only child, so I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, I wouldn't. It's really crowded. Is it? Um, it's too much. No, I love them. I and mean, then they were couldn't have been more wonderful. All of them, no matter what walk of life they're in. It was just that was the only one that was kind of a weird thing to broach. But other than that, it just kind of it became part of my reality. And as soon as I started going to high school, I, I came to the new school in ninth grade as a gay man and started that way and started dating right away. And I, dated, I got to have regular dating experiences all through high school, which I know is not a given for queer teenagers. That is really not a given. Um, which I was really thankful for. Most of my firsts happened at cast parties, most of them at the Into the Woods cast party in 10th grade. Um, was there a particular tune that you uh, <laughs> were? Singing in from Into the Woods? Sometimes people leave. Oh, oh. Now, how about that? What about that? Hmm. I mean, you're single now, right? Yeah. Yeah. How do you... <laughs> Not for long. <laughs> so, um, that's very young for that, I think, isn't it? Or am I just old and have a different perspective. For the dating and all of that? Yeah, I mean, that's I mean, so unusual. I mean, I, all, everyone around me was doing it, and I think if they for, were. for like straight teenagers, it's that's when you get to it, is high school. I mean, not in a very serious way. By dating, I mean like we said we were boyfriends and then for like two months would sit together at lunch and like kiss in, <laughs> kiss in the back of a car sometimes, and that was it. But like, okay. it, you know, not like real meaningful emotional relationships yet. Right. But, but getting to do the fun drama, dating, high sure. school thing. Sure. And there was only like, you know, maybe five or six of us in the school that were out and we just kind of rotated. <laughs> Did you ever think of going to another high school to like meet some of the people? Well, no, but that's another great thing about theater is you'd be hard pressed to do a project uh, any, of any kind in the theater and not meet a couple eligible suitors. That is Exactly. But it's dangerous though because dating other actors is tough. It's really, you. it's really tough. I mean, it's one of the things I swore that I would never do, and then I ended up marrying my husband, and he was an actor at the time. But now he's a writer, which is it may, it's so much. It's exactly so much, so much better. We want a creative, we want an artist, but not in the exact same. That, way. That's exactly right. Exactly, they want to know that you have to do eight shows a week. Exactly. Speaking of mm -hmm. eight shows a week. Yes. How do we do that? How do we do that? I don't know. You tell me. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I know you went off gluten. I know you went off dairy. I know you went off alcohol. I know you went off all of that to protect the voice. But that says something to me about you, about the dedication that you have in the, what I was talking about at the very beginning, which is the giving, the consistent giving, the giving of a performance. What is required of you? What do you feel is your responsibility to give to people who pay what they pay to come to see you? The answer is in my favorite musical theater song of all time, which is Finishing the Hat from Sunday in the Park with Joy. Oh. And he says that there's a part of you always standing by. And it's, it's, that's the truth, is when you're doing a piece of theater, particularly like Evan Hansen, no matter where you are, no matter who you're with, how much you're enjoying yourself, there's a piece of you that's always holding back and it's in service of the show you have to do later and that's right you're never completely released from that so it's it's 
there's a level of ap apprehension and anxiety that just exists and you have to just kind of get comfortable with because you wake up every morning and you go, mm -hmm, and you check and see if your voice is there and then mm -hmm. you, you take a nap, you try to stay quiet, and you try to you know, lubricate, you try to do all the things you need to do to really service that, those two and a half hours. And then after that, you spend the next 24 hours making sure that you can get back to that same place again. So yeah. go home and be quiet and don't be social and just turn the volume down on every other part of your life. and have faith that the people that are in your life are, are, care enough about you and understand enough how meaningful this is to you to know that you're not gonna be able to give them the same amount of time you usually would give them and mm -hmm. you're not gonna be as emotionally, physically, or mentally available to them during this time and and it has to be a role and a piece that you want to from your gut make that sacrifice for. I think it's hard to do something that you don't, I mean I've done things to varying degrees that I have, I mean I've luckily been in things mostly that I really loved but the, the amount of passion with Evan Hansen is, was very special so I think to, to give that much of myself and try to be that consistent, I think it was imperative that I, I, I actually loved the piece and the message that much. Right, did, and you did it for over a year. Oh, well, you started in D.C. Yeah. And you did Book of Mormon for almost a year in Chicago. I did, yeah, two years of Mormon. So I did a, a And book, then here. A year in Chicago and a year in, in right. Broadway. Right, right. That one was such a joy. I mean, that, that's my longest experience with a run, though, with a straight run, just right. two years in a row. And that, yeah. I don't know that I could ever do that again. It was, I mean, it's, it's so hard to keep it percolating and fresh and alive after mm -hmm. two full years of it. But that yeah. show is so joyful oh. and fun and people just come and forget their troubles. And like, it's just, that was, I mean, that, if there's anything you're gonna do for two years, that's a good one to do. Yeah, but, but Evan Hansen did, uh, oh, I have so many questions I wanna <laughs> ask you. I wish we had hours to be together. The, the, what, what you're talking about, did any of the, that, what you called sacrifice, sure. did any of that affect the relationships that you were trying to have with suitors? Did it? Certainly, I mean, I think in general, since, since then, you know, I've been pretty nonstop. When I was developing the show, we did the show, I went right into writing the album and made the album, went into making The Politician and, so I've been very, you know, career focused and focused on myself and trying to take advantage of the time that I can be selfish and there are no people that are dependent on me, particularly children that are dependent on me. Which there will be someday. God willing, yes. God willing, knock wood. Um, poop, poop, we poop. save the planet in time. Um, um, we, we better. We will, we'll figure it out. We have Greta. Um, <laughs> Um, but certainly it's, it's you know, I, I've definitely put it on the back burner and for me it's also, you know, I have this song in my album which I'm sure we'll talk about, Share Your Dress, which is like poking fun at how I go all in very quickly and mm -hmm. that's very much true but the, what's behind that really is I don't really have the time to invest in something unless I believe it could be the thing. Like I don't, I don't, you know, I have a lot of friends and that, that, who's to say if that's a healthy thing or not, there's a lot of friends who have experiences that they don't necessarily see as maybe the end all be all. They can't necessarily see this person as their life partner, but it's a healthy relationship and it's a positive experience. And I've never been the kind of person that has the mental space or the emotional space to be vulnerable with someone and to get really involved with someone and try to share my life with someone unless I can really see that it has potential to be the, the thing. person. Mm -hmm. So that makes the picking really, really overly sometimes um, harsh and like particular. Um, so I'm trying to balance that and not write people off too soon, but also be aware that I'm, you know, I'm not all there just to kind of have a good time. I, I have a lot of other things I want to be accomplishing and focusing on that make me happy and make me a full person. Like, like this album that we played as you were all coming in. Um, um, it's really, really special. The, the um, you know, I, I have to say, you know, you're talking about Dear Evan Hansen, and one of the things that Benji Pasek, of the famous Pasek and Paul, who wrote Dear Evan Hansen, and- Another um, Jew. Uh, and yes, another, that's right, another Jew, that, just the, the Pasek part is the Jew part. And, um, and um, they wrote La La Land. Yes, they did. Also, so, um, one of the things that he said about you that I love so much, and listening to you right now, it's really, it's so, vitally expressive from you is he said um, uh, he said Ben is a unicorn we can't believe he exists but we are so lucky that he does and that is my experience of you and there's I mean you've you've done a lot of different things I mean you've done a lot of films you were in Pitch Perfect Pitch Perfect 2 I'm sure many of you have seen that right um, and what one of the things that I, in this, in this conversation, 
the things that you're sharing with us now, the things that I find most valuable in watching you and in being with you is your authenticity. And that you are, it's just like you say, I'm not, I, I'm not available to all these people. I have something where I want to go all in. The, the thing that I find fascinating is that you have, and, in, and it's actually in the, the lyrics of um, <laughs> Ease My Mind. Can we pull that up for a second? And we, can we hear just the first two verses of that? Because I want to talk to you about how you be who you are and how you have the Mishigas that you have. If you don't know what Mishigas is, it's like Mishugananess. <laughs> Most days, I wake up with a pit in my chest. There are thoughts that I can't put to rest. There's a worry that I can't place. Most nights, I am restless and quiet won't come. So I lay there and wait for the sun There's a trouble that won't show its face You came out of nowhere And you cut through all the noise I make sense of the madness When I Thank you so much. You have this, you call yourself a warrior. Mm -hmm. You say you are obsessed in some ways about the things that you think of over and over and over again. And the lyrics to that are so potent and powerful and also painful to me that how do you live with that in this person that is so incredibly generous, warm, connected, centered, um, gracious? How do you reconcile that? How do you handle that? I know I want to know how to handle that. <laughs> I mean, I have no definitive answer. It's, it's a daily thing. but. I, th I just think I've learned that the answer to that is in other people. And, and, and I think whether that means most importantly and most, most sort of specifically and consistently performing and sharing my s stories and my songs, like in those moments, that's when it's the, the most quiet and the most calm and I really can overcome all of that in, at those times. But that also manifests in the right kind of relationship, like that song's about where someone can get you out of your own head and make you present, or talking to people who've been affected by work I've done, or you know, being with my family or being with my friends. I think, I think the number one way out of your own head is into other people's heads, and so I think that's part of the reason I like to share my experiences and hope that it affects people, and also get into the heads of other characters and take those people on and get out of myself for a minute. But with the album, you're not covering up with a character. No. You're doing something very different. different. What compelled you to do that? Was it partly this stuff that goes on with you? Yes, and also I think, I mean, I have just always wanted to write music, but B, I think after Evan Hansen, that, that experience was like 99% the greatest thing that's ever happened to me and the greatest gift and 1% a really difficult obstacle because you become so synonymous with a piece and with a character that people just assume that that's you. And I certainly have a lot of Evan in me and Evan has a lot of me in him and always will, mm -hmm. but I'm not that person and that's not my words, that's not my songs, that's not my personality, that's not my story. Right. And I was thinking, you know, what is, how do I make myself feel heard in a different way and to diverge from that 
and also do something that I'm not getting to do as an actor and stretch myself in a way that I'm not getting to be stretched as an actor. And that was, how do I, how do I share my own perspective and my own experiences and me as Ben, you know, so that when I'm disguising myself into different characters, it can be because I had that outlet. You know what I mean? It's not just the only way that I'm presenting to the world is through these other people. I get to also present now as myself, which is, I, I've, I think, more vital than I even realized. And now that I've done it and Definitely. incorporated that into the world that of, of things I do, it's, now, it's something I always want to go back to. Say, say more about that. The, I mean, there's that, it, it's like, there's a, there, what I, what I want to say about it is that so many of us are spending our lives seeking, mm -hmm. trying to be somebody. Mm -hmm. And that's not my experience of you. You reflect an experience of someone who is curious, who is not seeking. So what are you curious about now? What are, what are the questions you're entertaining now? I think as a person, the questions are very much, you know, what do I need in, a, in someone to spend life with? And what, do I, what are the things that make me happy? And what are the things that I'm doing because I think I'm supposed to do them? You know, what are... Supposed to do them. What is that? Intuition? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a pressure to, at a certain point, start taking a certain kind of job or living a certain kind of life or representing yourself in a certain way uh, just because like that's what you do and I'm trying to listen to what do I really want to do and what are the things that make me happy and what are the crazy 18 year musical movie projects that no one thinks is going to happen that I believe in you know what I mean right right you mean like merrily we roll along I do mean how that about that along. is that what you meant yeah yeah, that is something like that. Something like that with your best friend, Beanie Feldstein. Mm -hmm. Hello, Beanie. How about that? The greatest person. Really extraordinary. I mean, we could do a whole other talk about Beanie. Yeah, and, and maybe we will. Maybe we will. Maybe. When you're doing your 10 years of Merrily We Roll Along, we'll come back and we'll do that. But, but what, what, what that produces, that kind of risk-taking, that kind of listening, that kind of intuit, listening to your intuition, actually creates freedom. Mm -hmm. And most people, I find, are very afraid to be that free because it means you have to face uncertainty. Yep. How do you do that? I think I just have to keep reminding myself. I mean, it's difficult because you, you, there are a lot of traps, but I think I just keep reminding myself, like, I, I, I'm only going to be me, and I'm only ever going to be me, and I have what I have. And sometimes it's not what other people have. And, and I, you know, it's such a waste of time to invest in anything else. Like anytime I even lean into something else, some sort of other kind of thought or try to fit in and be like someone I see doing something else or, or something like aspire to be something that isn't who I am. It's, it just is fruitless. There's no, there's nowhere to go. And it's, 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 it's trying to put a square peg in a round hole or however you say it. And so I think even, at the times when it makes the choices scarier or it makes them less, you know, like generally lauded by the people around me, then as long as it's things that I'm excited about that are making me happy, then I think while I have the creative driver's seat, you know, I might not always have that. So while I have it, I'm going to use it. You know? Why would you think you wouldn't always have it? You know the biz, it goes up and down and, you know, it could be in five years from now and it's like, who's that Jew? Get him off the stage, you know? <laughs> You never oh, know. I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> uh, no, and and th th that's what watching the the you know your concert. Not a concert. What is it on Sunday night? What it, w this room, ra Radio City, filled to the rafters, completely. Every seat sold out. Filmed for Netflix. You and Atlantic Records. I mean, what is the, what would, the freedom that you expressed, were you nervous? Were you terrified? I, I would be beside my, were you throwing up like you were when you were six? <laughs> and, your, and your parents said to you, no, you can do this? What, what happened? Because you got out there, and I've, I've never seen freedom like that. Anybody who was there will attest to this. It's like the most free I've, I've ever seen anyone in a performance. 
I mean, cer certainly there's apprehension and worry, but it's not the kind where I'm worried about the doing of the thing. The, what I'm just trying to always get to is the doing of the thing. Like what I can't wait for is those two hours of the actual doing of the thing. And there's just so many things that can get in the way in my mind before we get there. Like, am I vocally healthy enough? Am I, did I sleep enough last night? You know, uh, is the light gonna come up at the right time at the top? And you know, is everyone gonna be seated? Are people gonna be in the bathroom before we start? Do we need to hold another five minutes? You know, do, do, uh, is the show too long? Do I need to take the Stevie Wonder number out? Do I need to put rain at the end because it's so high energy? Do I, you know, it's like all these things of just trying to make those two hours as great as they can be all the way leading up to them so that when they're happening, all I have to do is live in them because I've thought everything through beforehand and I've perfected it and I've gone through all the scenarios in my head so that while it's happening, I'm not thinking about those things. I'm thinking about, look at all these people who are here. Look how amazing this feels. Uh, the sounds can just come flying out. And uh, for me, it's all about preserving the actual doing of the thing. And, and you give so many props to all of your people. I mean, that's the only way it happens, especially in a concert like that. Not for everybody. That's what I'm talking about about you. It's not true for everybody. It's true for you. And that's what I'm trying to get at tonight is to say, how is it from you? Is it your parents? Is it your Grandma Sue? Can we talk about Grandma Sue? Of course we can. She's the best. Um, she's, she's no longer in body, but she's certainly present. Of course, always. And I mean, it's as much my parents as it is both of their mothers, who both are no longer here. The other, my other grandma's were Grandma Joan, and this is hers. I wear it like everywhere in every interview, every show, everything. Um, it's what they instilled in my parents and then what they instilled in me, which is that being a decent human being is number one, and anything else comes after that. So success and being a fantastic artist and being brilliant and having any kind of genius or being, you know, any of this stuff, it's all great. It's all wonderful, and it deserves to be celebrated, but it means absolutely nothing if you're not being an empathetic and good person, because totally otherwise, agree. what's the point? And the whole point of art in general, particularly theater or live performance or acting, is to sh shed light on other people and other people's perspectives and get people to feel for other people. And so if you're not doing that in your regular life, then you're sort of, I feel like an imposter, I think. You are. Um, so I, right. I, I attribute it entirely to them and the fact that they make sure that my feet stay firmly planted on the ground. And to my friends, I, I'm, I got really lucky in high school <clears throat> and at the Adderley School, and I made like lifelong friends, um, some from when I was like six and seven and a lot from like 13, 14. And they're still in your life now? Beanie is one of them, right. my, my friend Catherine Gallagher, <clears throat> <clears throat> my friend Natalie Margolin, who's a brilliant playwright, my friend Melanie Bornstein, my friend Max mm -hmm. Sheldon. We have like a really insular, tight group of people. My friend Nick Lieberman, who directed all of my music videos, right. who is a really brilliant director who's been directing me in comedy videos since we were 14. It's just, you know, you find those people who it has nothing to do with any of the stuff that's going on and you invest in those relationships and you know that that's, that's what matters. You know, if, if, you know, God forbid Radio City had gone up in flames and some horrible thing had happened and, and the whole show had tanked, I could have spent Monday the same way I spent it, which was on my couch with those people, talking to them and ordering food and, you know, making jokes about the people we saw at the show. It's like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't matter how it went, um, of course, they're wonderfully supportive and they love me and they want it to go beautifully, but to them that doesn't matter. What matters is that we get to hang out the next day. So, yeah, I think that keeps me, and, and, and just an understanding from my dad, from learning from him that y you don't get anywhere without the people around you. I mean, it takes a village in every right. sense, particularly with this concert with these incredible singers and musicians. In a musical, it takes everyone, it takes the crew, it takes the cast, it takes the pit, it takes everyone. It's, it, you can't get it, like in The Politician even. It's, I was just it's, gonna say, yeah. You know, I, 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 when Ryan asked me to be the exec executive producer, I'm like, well, you're Ryan, Brad, and Ian. Like, what the hell am I gonna add to this? And the one thing I really tried to do is, is foster that kind of a community and make it feel like we're all part of a team and we're in one family. And, and it does feel like that. I mean, it very much does. That's A, the point of the experience, and B, that's when people do the best work, when they feel like they owe it to, to the whole. So I'm well, the, I think what, what, what we do, and particularly this and particularly the album, um, which is called Sing to Me Instead, in case some of you don't know that, but it, the, the, it's, the, it, it's a team sport. Oh, for I've sure. always said it's a team sport, and that's the thing. That's the, the finding of the tribe and listening to your intuition and having that fluidity and that connection. And I, I find right now in our world we're so conflicted and we're so divided and we're so up against who we actually, and what we keep seeing is a demonstration of 
who we actually are as human beings. And you mirror that for us. You reflect that for us. Even in your speaking, even what you're pointing to right now, are the things that are of the utmost value. Those are the things that matter. I mean, you and I can come and sit and you know, talk at the 92nd Street Y, and we can have all these lovely, wonderful people with us. And when we're connecting at this kind of level about what really matters, and that's what I was speaking to before about like not, you're not seeking, you're not chasing, you're living in the, the, the space, the room of, of possibility. And you're, you're reminding us of the freedom and the essence of who we really are. You know, it's like we get so caught up in this and this and the phone and the thing and the computer and the, all of that stuff. And then there's this other part of us, this whole larger awareness. Mm -hmm. That's who we actually really are. And I don't think we give it enough space or enough energy. I agree. Do you find that? Totally. And Live performance especially is like the best place to do that, to like convene over that, is to have people come into a room. And that's why it's sad that less and less people are going to see movies together in public and stuff, is because, not that I don't love watching things at home and watching Netflix at home. <laughs> um, the politician in particular mm -hmm. on Netflix. It's a great new show. Um, but, uh, but you know, like that's, that's a part of, I try to talk about it in the show too, Radio City is like, it's, it's the convening and the, the letting go of distractions for an hour and a half and having a common experience. And like, that's what makes Evan Hansen so special is people come into the room from all different walks of life and like become immediately vulnerable all together in a dark room and like have one similar experience. That's why like, you know, I, I, didn't, I really didn't mean to bring this up just right now because of what ha happened. I, no, no tea, no shade, it's okay, phones are phones. But in musicals, when phones go off, it's, it's agonizing. It is, it is so agonizing. It's like. For us and for you. It's unbelievable. It, yeah. It's just like literally the only decision that has to be made when you sit down to watch something is to turn off your phone. That's the only one. It's like, like. <laughs> you know, you know they're doing this new thing now. Have you seen the, the new thing where you go to the theater and they, they put your cell phone in a locked packet and I, you sat up that's like. A, that's a patent right there. I, how about how about that? Yeah, I went to see Hannah Gatsby, and they, that's what they did. Oh yes, Dar I did too, and that's what right? they did. Right, Daryl Roth, the producer, she said, "That's what we're going to do," and that's what. And I think they're doing it a lot now. And I, I get it. Like I, I feel so addicted to my phone, and I feel so like it's an appendage, and we all do. And it's like I can't imagine not being able to connect to people in a, mo in a moment's notice, and right. I feel worried without it. Like I had it fixed at the Apple store and I had to give it to them for three hours. So I was roaming New York for three hours with no way to be reached. And I was like, what if something happened? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's very Jewish. You know, yeah. <laughs> but the whole but point of getting transported is getting transported, you know? At the concert, it's one thing. I'm happy for people to film and you know, whatever. Like right, that's beautiful, right. the pictures, that's fine. But when it's a story and we're gonna all leave reality for a second and go somewhere different, then you gotta turn it off. Right, but it, it's, it's also what you're talking about, where you, this, this addiction yep. that we have, mm -hmm. that we have to get in touch with everybody right away. Yes. Now, one of the things I would say that I was completely stunned and mesmerized by was when you texted me and said, do you want to come to the concert? Do you have, here are the tickets, here's what, you gave me everything. And I wrote you back and I said, yes, I'd like to come, and don't you have people who do this for you? <laughs> I was, it was absolutely the most personal, connected, and all of us that were sitting in that row were politician family. It was just so beautifully done, gifted, organized, and it came from you. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this, when it's a special case as this, I mean, I have wonderful people working for me and helping me and, and making things happen and like putting these amazing clothes on me that I could never choose for myself and like, <laughs> and you know, and like organizing the way I'm gonna tr travel and be safe and all of that. But when it's something that means as much to me as a, a, a Radio City show, I mean, it's like I wanna decide, I wanna be the one who's administering, you know, all, all the people in my life coming and making sure that politician folks get to be together and my folks from high school get to be together. And, you know, I think that maybe, you know, Billy Eichner and Anna Kendrick maybe would love sitting together, so let's put them together. Like, you know, it's, it's I want it to be as So you as were great. doing a bar mitzvah. Exactly. 
I mean, it totally. I was like, do we have the tablecloths with the pink under things and the gold overlays and Let the glasses? You, on Saturday night before the concert, me, my mom, and my sister were sitting around the table. I, I wore my mom's glasses because the little dots for the seats were really small. And we did like a wedding. We were like, okay, so we'll put this group of a 10 here. And then if this is an eight, we can do like a five and a three. And they'll be behind each other so they can talk to each other. <laughs> But that's what the fun of it is for me, is like curating the experience, because I want it to be special for everyone, and it goes back to that thing of like, if, I've, if I know everyone's sitting, I know right. everyone that's gonna be there, I know what's gonna happen, I have all of that figured out, then when it's happening, I, none of that is in my mind, because it's all figured out. What do you think the thing is that drives you to have that be the experience? Because it, maybe it's not this worry, maybe it's not like ease my mind, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's not the worry, maybe it's the, really very special organizational gift to other people. Maybe it's not Meshuga. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's a combo. There's, there's the healthy parts of it like that, and then there's also the not so healthy parts about being hypochondriac and waking up and worrying that everything. Are you? Oh. <gasps> oh my God. I woke up one time with a bump on the back of my neck and I was like, uh, it's over. And then, uh -huh. and then I went to the You doctor. know everybody's I, laughing I, I, in recognition I, of you know. this, right? I, I went, I was like, mom, you need to make me an appointment with the doctor in an hour. And I went to the doctor urgently. I sat down on the table. He looks at me for 20 seconds and he goes, that's a pimple. And then he leaves. <laughs> <laughs> so that's like story of my life. So like things like that aren't great. I'm very bad at flying. That really gives me a yeah, lot. Yeah, we were talking a about A lot of anxiety this. leading up to and following flights. W what's I just, the anxiety? What, what is it? La lack of control. Like, as you can tell, I like to have control and know exactly what's going to happen and be Say hello to the human race. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's absolutely nothing you can do in that situation, and I have no knowledge about planes, and you know what I mean? It's like, and, it, and it's also the space. It's not that I'm necessarily claustrophobic. It's just in every other scenario in your life, if you needed to get, get out, out and take a moment, you could get out and take a moment. In the plane, you cannot get out and take a moment because you'd fall out of the sky. Um, right. So it's just not my favorite place to be, but I'm getting better. I'm learning. I have, I, when I go with buddies, it's better. I just did a big tour for Politician, and our sweet, sweet Zoe Deutsch came with me, and she yeah. played just games with me and distracted me and and and, and we drank with you together and drank with me. Yes, there you go. And then go. drank with me some more. And and, um, and and then we took our sequels at the same time. Oh, that. And it was great. This is, this is all working beautifully. Speaking of the politician, mm -hmm. how did Ryan come to you? He came to Dear Evan Hansen, along with everybody that I've ever met, um, <laughs> which was amazing, all in the course of one year. That's another great thing about doing a show, is that you, you, it just forces everyone in your life at some point to come to you. So you get to just, through the course of 12 months, just see each and every person. Yeah. Um, but he came, uh, and he came you know, waltzing in backstage in a beautiful fur coat off of his shoulders. Oh my god. Um, and just saying, you know, like, that was insane. And like, that, you know. Oh my God, you sounded exactly like him. <laughs> <gasps> We've got to make something. Oh. And I was like, um, I mean, I would, you are literally the most brilliant genius there is in television, so of course I want to make something. But I, you know, it's like the same thing of when Pascal and Paul reached out to me after I auditioned for them for a different show, and they said they wanted to make something. You think like. Dogfight. Exactly, for dogfight. Right. It's, you think like, oh, that's beautiful, and they want to tell me that they appreciate my talent, right. but like, you never really think that's going to happen. And then he reached out to me like three or four weeks later and said, when are you in LA next? And I said, I'm gonna be there for vacation from the show for one week. And he said, shave me a lunch. I saved him a lunch, we went to lunch. I sat down expecting like either just a general get to know you or like a, will you come be on an episode of American Horror Story? And what I got was like, the show's gonna be called The Politician. I created this character for you. His name is Peyton Hobart. And we're gonna have you play someone egomaniacal and sociopathic and confident. And you're gonna take up space and you're gonna dress well and you're not gonna wear and a you're gonna old be navy sexy. polo. Yes, <laughs> and you're gonna be sexy and you're gonna be mean. and. And he was like, you're gonna do something different and we're still gonna use all of your favorite skills. You're gonna to get to sing in, in the right moments and you're gonna to get to be vulnerable and you get to show the humanity of an anti-hero. And you know, we're gonna have a lot of young people who are also theater actors and, and Gwyneth's gonna be your mother. And <laughs> I was like. <laughs> And, and what Jessica, was that last one? And, Je oh. and Jessica Lange's going to be your... I mean, yeah. a nemesis, I guess. I don't know what. Um, but yeah, he just laid... You know him. He's just such a clear, clear vision. And then he follows through on every, totally. every level of it. Totally. And so it was a no-brainer. Because I was looking for, like I said, the right thing to diverge from Evans. And, and that was it. Right. And that's the thing. It's often so challenging in the industry. But like I go back to the thing again. You weren't chasing it. You weren't seeking it. You weren't trying to be somebody. You already know that you are someone. You own that. You own that space inside of you. And that's a very, very rare connection, a 
a very rare knowing. I think you know that. You know that it's, that it's unusual, but that it's very important to give that as a, as a demonstration, as a, not a demonstration that makes you sound like An a example. I mean, yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, do you know? I not mean, yet. I, oh, okay, okay, no. we'll, we'll be looking forward to that. But I, they, they, but the, no, but the, 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 the knowing of that, to, to mirror that, to reflect that for all of us. Yeah, I mean, I think you were saying before, like there's so much division right now, particularly, and it's a lot of, um, oh, here comes some fabulous note cards for you. Oh my God, um, you are. Hi, sweetie, thanks. Um, no, no, we have to stay longer. I've no. done talking to you, right? Yeah. All right. Oh God, they're gonna kill me. I hear them backstage going, oh my God, that girl. <laughs> um, uh, I have some questions from the audience, but w you were just saying something and I kind no, of... No, just, just to respond to the beautiful things that you just said about me, which I can't really accept most of them, but I'll say that, you know, what I do own and what I try to, you know, emulate and what I try to sort of give out into the world is that I understand what makes me different and I understand what makes me unique and what makes me myself. And I think people who come to watch someone do anything or watch an actor do something on screen or on stage or watch me sing my own music, anything, as much as they want to see someone who they see themselves in and can relate to, what we want to see is the difference in people. And I think right. we're forgetting that like the, that's the best part is like, that's the reason we're all here at the same time. Is like, if we were all a bunch of the same, you know what I mean? Like I just went to Maggie Rogers uh, concert. Oh like, God. If you don't know Maggie Rogers, get into yeah. it. I promise you won't be sad. Um, and she is like so her own animal, her own creature. I mean, she yeah. has a beautiful voice and, and, and like that's a huge part of it, but she that's moves not it. and acts and is her own creature that is not like anyone I know. And so that's what's fascinating and we should revel in that, not be like looking for the differences as reasons to be distant from people. Be distant from people or to uh, denigrate ourselves, mm -hmm. to say, oh God, I'll never be like that, I'll never be like that him, her, That's the them. Best thing. I'll never be like that because no one will ever be me. like me. Mm -hmm. Right. Ex I'll never be Timmy Chalamet and Timmy Chalamet will never be me. Right. <laughs> right. And like when you talk about people that you love, I mean like Sam Smith. Oh my gosh. They are a and wonderful person. Yeah, really extraordinary. Or people, I mean like George Michael or anybody who's not you, but Adele. I mean, uh. you... To invoke Adele's name. Worship at the, at the feet of. But that's what you're talking about. And I think so many of us spend our time and our lives going, God, if I could only be like that, if I could only be like Ben Platt. But it's like, no, don't be, be like him in the demonstrations of who you are, the sure. reflections of the graciousness, the generosity, all of that. Model that. But find out who you are. An unexamined life is not worth living. 100%. And it's like, wh how do we look at ourselves? How do we discover ourselves? What does that mean? What, who are we? What do we bring to this world? It's like Greta Thunberg. I mean, look at her. Yeah. I mean, she is systematically changing the world in relation to climate change. Yep. And it's like, <laughs> just, and it's like, you've talked about millennials too. You say, actually, the perception of millennials is not the correct perception. I don't think so. I mean, I think largely it's like we're this lazy, sort of aimless group of people, and certainly any given group of people is going to have a lot have that. of laziness in there and some aimlessness in there. But I think, I think it's a noble pursuit to be like, what can I do that will make me happy, and what's going to make me special, and what's going to what's my passion. And I think you have to be realistic about what your abilities are, of course, and what you can really bring to the table. But if you're taking that into account, then you should be searching for the things that are going to make you happy and not settling for something else. Well, it, it, to me, it's not just what makes you happy. It, it, what fills it, you up? What, fil mm -hmm. what fills you up? Mm -hmm. What are you passionate about? Happy is boring and also unrealistic. It's, it's more it, than that. Yeah, but right. And what are you, what are you passionate about? Mm -hmm. what, what drives you? What, what, is that, what is that thing? And we all know it. And we don't spend enough time, I think, looking at it very much like you have. You said, someday I want to do a solo album. Mm -hmm. And when you sat down at the piano to play, it's like, this is not the Ben Platt that I know. 
and all of a sudden you were this other person and you had this banter that's just completely wonderful and hysterical that just makes everybody laugh. Thank I mean, you know, telling everybody, you know, that you have 14 bottles of water up there and that you have water burps and then you have, <laughs> you know, and then you had to go out and pee and then, I mean, all that kind of it's true. funny, fabulous, you I hate peanut butter. don't want me thinking about me having to pee. I don't want me singing thinking about having to pee. I'm gonna go pee. Right. <laughs> And give your and give your folk and give an, those incredible singers a chance to show what they can do. I mean, come on, really fabulous. Okay, um, no, we'll wrap up by eight forty-five. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Um, uh, mm. Whoever asked this question, I love you because I wanted to play this and I wanted to play it before when we were talking about Grandma Sue and your folks. What is the inspiration behind the song, In Case You Don't Live Forever, on your album? It's my favorite. It's so beautiful. And that's from Ashley. Thank you, Ashley. I love that song, too. Um, well, the song is kind of a crossroads of a couple of ideas. It, it, the inception came from my co-writer, Michael Pollack, oh. um, who is an unbelievably brilliant co-writer. And he wrote on uh, Older With Me as well. And he wrote on Better With Me. Uh, and he wrote on Rain, which is a fantastic song. Um, but he, um, he was like, I really want to do a song about my dad. Do you, can you relate to that? Do you have something that you want to say about your dad? And I was like, do I? Um, and so it started with this idea of, you know, just all the things I would love to say to my dad. We, we have this closeness and this kind of relationship that I'm sure you can relate to where it's like, you feel all these things, but you don't always feel the need to say them because it's like, oh, it's a given. You know, we talk every day. I love my dad. I love him. He's my hero. But, but I don't say to him every day on the phone, I love you. You mean the world to me, you know. But it, it was those kind of things. It was like, let me take a moment and really say those things. And then thankfully, you know, toy, 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 my dad is fine. He's healthy. He's here. And he's doing great. Um, and that we kind of married that with a very separate idea of saying things before it's too late. And, and not just saying them, uh, you know, to, to express them, but also say them while the person is here. And so that became very much for me about, very recently became about my grandma Sue because she passed away when we were about to go on tour. But while writing the song, it was very much about my uncle Gary, who was my dad's uncle, he's my great uncle, uh, the only other gay member of my family growing up. I, my, my little brother is now also queer, but which is awesome and we get to bond over when that. When did you find that out? Uh, he came out in high school, so like a, a few years ago. Oh, fantastic. Um, but, but growing up, yeah, I know, it's the best. My mom got two gay sons. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> But that, that's a mother's dream. But, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but Gary, you know, he was the only other representation that I had of that. And mm -hmm. um, I loved him. And he, my dad and him had such a special relationship, too. He was the one who took him to theater growing up and fostered his love of the arts and of theater. And, you know, my dad has just dedicated this beautiful, uh, 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 I don't know what you call it, like a chair, like a, a certain sum of money that, uh, to, mm -hmm. to it's off Broadway to MCC in the name of new playwrights and new works uh, in his name, in Uncle, in Uncle Gary's name. Yeah. So that, for me, was that what that song came from. That's where it came from. Can you just play a little bit of that, just so everybody can get connected to it for a minute? Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> in case you don't oh, live forever. In case you don't live forever. <laughs> ben and I can sing it for you now. <laughs> no. She's off the clock. <laughs> He'll find it in a minute. Um, the, um, um, will your cover of River from The Politician be on Spotify? Um, I, nothing is for sure at the moment, but we were chatting about that just today, so stay tuned. <gasps> Yum. Um, Whoever asked that, thank you, and Joni Mitchell. Joni Mitchell. <laughs> Joni I mean, Mitchell. I'm sure everybody here knows it's a Joni Mitchell song, but let me tell you, I've been to some youth screenings of The Politician and had kids come up to me and be like, what a great song they wrote for you. <laughs> and I was like, I love you, but get out of my face. <laughs> <laughs> it's Joni Mitchell. <laughs> yeah, I mean. The great, great, anyway. Really yes. extraordinary. Okay, what was the most difficult scene to film in The Politician? Fabulous question. That's from Chase. Uh, oh boy, two, uh, two come to mind for two very different reasons. One being, would be the last scene of episode seven, which is mm. uh, Gwyneth and I, if you haven't seen it, I don't want to spoil too much. Okay, I'm not going to say what's happening, but we're, we're, we're Gwyneth There's and I. There's so much screaming I happening. promise we won't. 
Saved by the bell. You put all your faith in my dream. You gave me the world that I wanted. What did I do to deserve you? I follow your steps with my feet. I walk on the road that you started. I need you to know that I heard you every word. I've waited way too long to say everything you mean to me. In case you don't live forever, let me tell you now, I love you more than you'll ever wrap your head around. In case you don't. I mean, I could sit and listen to this album over and over and over again. I said to somebody, have you heard Ben Platt's uh, album sing to me? And said, she said, I sit at my desk all day and that's all I'm listening mm -hmm. to. Yeah. Um, back to the spoilers. Yeah. Um, uh, also, you should have already watched it, so no, I'm kidding. Um, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Take your time, savor it, savor it. Um, so I won't say what's the plot is happening, but it's the end of uh, episode seven and Gwyneth and I are, 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 are saying a farewell and it's, it's just a really, I have to be in a very, very emotional space. And it, it's not like Evan Hansen where I had the opportunity to live the story in order and get there as an actor and arrive there on the journey. It was like, show up to work at 8 a.m. You got it. You know, there you starting go. with your coverage and you're sobbing. So it's like, you know, it's, it's about putting yourself in the right mindset and listening to the right music and being, you know, somewhat impolite to people in the morning and saying, I, I can't really talk to you today. I need to be in my own space. And so that was challenging. And then the other one is in episode three, there's a, I, I make a discovery about my best friend uh, sort of betraying me in a certain way. Uh, and he and I have this big walk and talk where we walk down a hallway and I'm rattling off this really long metaphor mm. that's very wordy. And it was my first experience with like true Ryan Murphy, Brad Falchuk, Ian Brennan, like chewy, chewy language, oh, yeah. bulky monologue yeah. while like walking and being like, stay out of this light, but also land on this mark, but also be in this window and also point to him with this arm. But then the camera's gonna come in this way and you're gonna change it and he's gonna be this dot instead of his face because he's gonna be this close to you now. So it's like, it was the first time where I was like, oh God, I'm making a TV show, this is very hard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so those were the two. Yes. That's very, uh, I mean, what you just defined is the glamour of the business. Exactly. Right. Luckily, it was in a beautiful, gorgeous mansion, so it was great. <laughs> right, but how did you, how many times did you have to do it? A few, but it was, it was Janet Mock, the, the phenomenal Janet Mock. Love was her. her. Oh uh, my God. And she, gave, she was patient. She said, you know, take, you know, take your time, find it, and once you feel comfortable, then we'll come in closer, and you know, we're, we're not gonna move till you're happy. And so. Do you like to know when they're coming in closer? Yes. You do. I do. Because I don't. I, I find that I feel it anyway. You know what I mean? Like if it's not, it's the same as like knowing someone's coming to my show, like knowing like Meryl's gonna be there or something. It's right. Like, I don't wanna be like looking while acting and be like, oh, Meryl Streep. You know, I wanna like. Right. I want to know she's there. Do you there. do that? Did, did, did you do that in Dear Evan Hansen? Did well, you no, because I, I got a list every single night before the show. You of, did? Of all the names that were You wanted there. to know? Yes, because I spend so much time in that show, like looking out at the crowd and, and right. giving so much of the performance outward that I'm going to spot, and it's a small space, so I'm right. going to spot anyone. So it's right. just, I want to just know. It's, it goes all back to the same thing. I want to have all the information before the show <laughs> so that when the show's happening, I can just be doing the show. But this is so interesting because when I wrote to you and I said, are there things you don't want to talk about? Is there anything you want to know about? You were just like, whatever. Well, I trust you. And look, and I was right to look what, look what you've done. Oh, you're so lovely. You're so lovely. <laughs> I, I, I could be his grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> I should be so lucky. Um, thank you. By the way, the things that I was saying about you before that you said were difficult for you to take in, they weren't compliments, they were truths. What's we're next? We're all gonna have a conniption, all right. <laughs> <laughs> what's, um, what's next for you? Another album, Netflix show. He hasn't finished this first one. We have to go to work together this year. Uh, Broadway, EGOT. <laughs> we, we heart you, Ali and Kira. Oh, thanks, Ali and Kira. <laughs> um, oh, God. Uh, 
here's what's next uh, immediately. We start making our second season of our TV show in about three weeks. That's right. And if you make it to episode, mm -hmm. and if you make it to episode eight, you will see very clearly what the two of us will be doing, and you'll be very excited about it. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the immediate thing. I'm, I'm still writing music very much, so I have a couple songs that I've written, and I, I'm going to LA next week to do some more Professor Politician, and while we're there, I'm gonna write some more songs. Right. Um, as far as the album goes, certainly I would love to have a second album at some point, but it's all about when is there enough of a body of work to make an album. I, I'm sure I'll release a couple more songs like Rain, where they're just kind of songs that live on their own, but, mm -hmm. but when, when I'm ready to have like a whole new story, that's when I'll have a new album, but I don't think you can rush something like that. This first album took about oh, 13 months. Um, that's not a lo very long period of time, though. But no, but uh, but I think that's out of the fact that you had been building that up over time. Yeah, I had a, I, I sort of had all these experiences that I was ready to process and write about. So mm -hmm. now I just have to have some more experiences. Oh, right. Um, uh, the EGOT would be a great like cherry on top, but I'm in zero zero rush to like finish that and put a check on it because like it's all happened very quickly already. So like the longer it takes, the better. Um, also, it's already happening. <laughs> it's sort of like, you know, the pencil's already dropped. It's just a matter of time when it hits the exactly. table. Exactly. So when it hits, it hits. And yeah. I'll be happy to be in any of the films. Um, there's, a, there's a Dear Evan Hansen movie that maybe or maybe is not happening. We're not sure about. Right. Um, how, do you, how do you feel about that? You know what? We're being so candid and honest here tonight. I'm, yeah. feeling, I'm feeling lots of things about it. Okay. I, we don't know, I have no idea of the reality of it. We will find out in the next months or so. But, and there's lots of variables that are out of my hands. It's a studio film. It's an adaptation. It's a lot of things have to happen. Right. I, you know, I want to, I would, if it comes together and happens, then I would love to do it. I, you know, I am fully aware that I'm a 26-year-old man and I'm not an 18-year-old man anymore. But the character and I are so married, and yeah. we're so wed, and it's such a special story, and it's a performance that I would really love to, to, to immortalize, even, even as a little bit of an older person. And so it's about kind of forgiving myself for that age thing, and just letting, that, letting the world forgive me for that too, and just doing it, so we'll see. You know, that's so, so great. I mean, this, is, this is that thing that I'm talking about. This is the, this is the life perspective perspective. This is the context of the way you hold things. And context and framing is all that's important. Your life is more important to you than anything. Mm -hmm. The career fits into that. Your relationships fit into that. Whatever comes next fits into that. But there's something about an energy. Macro. Yeah. There's something about an energy of going, I forgive myself for it. I trust that the audience who has seen me do this, many people have seen me do this, will also understand that it needs to be me. And whatever comes of that, comes of that. But that is, again, I go back to your, your intuition, your gut, where you, where you live from. And it's a very different place to live from than all this other stuff, all this craziness about the business. You know, people are going, oh my God, are you kidding? He's so long in the truth. Why are we going to let him do that? Like, that's not it. And it's not where you're coming from, so the energy shifts, makes a difference, makes a big difference. Um, okay, Carrie and Elizabeth, what is the most, I love that these people, <laughs> someone squealed. But I love that these people are doing it together, it's so sweet. It it's like, what is, the, uh, what is the most emotional song for you to sing from your album? Emotional is a hard word because I don't necessarily think that means what makes me the saddest. I think it's what like fills me up with the most emotion in general, and it's always eased my mind um, yeah. for multiple reasons. It's because of anxiety in general. It's because it's I've actually written a song that I like to listen to to make myself calm. Oh. It's because the relationship that I was in when I wrote it uh, was a really special relationship to me and really did make me feel all those things. And it's someone that still very much is a close friend of mine who I love and. It's just an experience I always go right back to when I play the song. I remember writing it, and I remember, I remember the experience of writing it with a brilliant, brilliant songwriter, Ben Abraham, who wrote a bunch of my record. He's absolutely one of the most gifted musicians I've ever met, and he is on Bad Habit. He wrote on Ease My Mind. He wrote on Temporary Love. He wrote on Grow As We Go. He is a big part of this album. Grow As We Go is another one, too, that's really interesting in your Special. perspective about relating, that you can stay with someone and grow with them. You don't have to leave them. So many people say, I have to leave you, I'm gonna leave you so that I can grow. Well, what? Wh you said you couldn't grow in, in the backyard. 
Right. Yeah. Who's, who said you can't grow with this, with your person? Yeah. And mm -hmm. what does that mean to do that? I think, I've always said, I think it's sometimes it's a really noble and correct thing to say, and it's, it really is the space you need, but I also think sometimes it's a, it's a defense mechanism. Absolutely. It's a way to say, like, oh, you're getting too close to me, and I need to figure out who I am, and it's like, well, I'll give you the space to do that. You will need, you know, you need me to leave you be for a little while, I can do that, like, uh, and I'm going to need that from you sometimes. Um, so, yeah, I love that. Yeah, that's beautiful. Also, um, Run Away. Mm. That's also another one. It's the first song I ever wrote alone. That's the only one on the album that is um, that no one else has touched at all besides me. How did that come about? I mean, for those of you who don't know it, we, we don't have to play it right now, but I think the, I mean, hey, I it's would actually, listen to this album all night, but. The, it's, it's hidden within The Politician three times if you watch The Politician. Um, yeah. Uh, it becomes sort of a theme of me and this other character. Um, yeah, I mean, it was just the Is first. Is this your parents? It's my parents. Ah, uh, I, so. I mean, the first thing I sat down and was like, what's the first thing that I feel strongly enough to write about? Of course, it's, it's them. So that was the first thing I tried my hand at, and I loved the song, and I recorded it alone in my apartment and on my little garage band with a little plug-in mic, and I sent it to my parents, and I was like, what do you think of this? And as soon as they loved it, I was like, well, okay, I'll send it to Atlantic, too. And so I sent it to Atlantic, and then we started the album. We love Atlantic. Um, Oh, this is great. Any tips for aspiring performers or actors? And what he says is, which is interesting, he says, any tips for inspiring performers or actors? So maybe he does mean that. Maybe I misinterpret. Like, how do I inspire others? Yeah, any tips for inspiring performers or actors? Yeah, and that's from Thomas Stang. I mean, a broken record, I feel like uh, whenever I'm asked for any kind of counsel or advice, like, I, you know, I'm on my own journey. I don't have a, lot, a ton of expertise to give because everybody has a different life but as soon as I started investing in what made me singular and what made me different and what made me earnest and effortful and and I didn't try to match anyone else's vibe or anyone else's map uh, that's when things started going really well so I think anything you can do to invest more in that than in yeah. shaping yourself to a box that's been working already is gonna bode well I think yeah Definitely. Do you think being gay gave you more of an insight in relating in that way? Because I've always looked at the community, I've always been inspired by your community, by the, the leadership, by what makes an authentic person. To me, you all have the technology for authenticity. Yes and no. I mean, I think yes, because we have no choice but to embrace who we are because that's the only way to survive. Well, some people don't. I know, unfortunately, mm -hmm. that it, right. you know, it takes a lot of people down and that's it's mostly society's fault. But also, you know, I think I, I'm really feeling very encouraged to be part of a generation where that my sexuality is a piece of my puzzle and a piece of my tapestry as right. an actor and as a person right. and is not the subject of my autobiography. It's not the source of my trauma. It's not the source of my adversity. It's not the source of oppression for me. I think it's obviously important to watch stories that represent that and remind us where we've come from, the same way as it's important to remember the, all this stuff the Jews have been through. And I think we shouldn't forget our history, but I think moving forward and not constantly feeling the need to make announcements and make proclamations and, and be very particular about um, you know, labeling and all of this, it's like, it's, it's, it's great because then we can move into so many more interesting things. Right. Like that's one of the best things about the politician is my character is sort of just queer because he's queer. You know, he has one relationship with a person who he's very much like and who is his equal, who he connects with because they're very similar and that happens to be a woman. And then he has a connection with someone who has all the things he doesn't because he's empathetic and he feels for everyone and my character can't do any of that. And he's a man and he loves him too. So, and you know, Gwyneth's character has a queerness to her and mm -hmm. Ronnie's Jones who plays Sky, her character has a right. queerness to her. And you know, it's-, it's Everybody in the politician in some way is very queer outside yeah. the box and defining them. And that's the kind of material I want to see. Yeah. I'm tired of just like the queer character being defined by their queerness. Right, mm -hmm. right. Did you ever think? <laughs> Bravo. Did you ever think that it might stop you? Did you ever fear it might? I fear that it would limit me. And I, I think we all still have that fear. Anyone who's queer has a fear that like, well, no one's ever going to cast me in, you know, the lead of a musical where the, the main love story is a man and a woman because mm -hmm. everybody knows on my Instagram that I date men. Like, you know what I mean? It's like you have to kind of release that and think like I want to work with people who are much more have a much more open mind than that and can focus on what are my abilities am I right for this character mm -hmm. can I make you know me and Laura Dreyfus fell madly in love eight times a week and I think it was pretty 
uh, effective. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, we I made out with her more than I made out with any of them I've ever dated. So. <laughs> Well, we want to look to change that. Um, <laughs> what, 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 what was your experience like working with chore choreographer Jaquel Knight on Rain music videos? Oh my God. Love your modified mashed potato. Yes, absolutely. For those of you who don't know that, that's from my generation, the mashed potato. Sarah Brickner. Sarah. Bricker. Sarah Brickner. Woo! Excellent question. It was a dream come true. For those who don't know, Jaquel Knight, um, he choreographed my video for the song called Rain, and he uh. is pretty legendary. He choreographed little music videos like Single Ladies and Formation. Um, Just little things like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he is absolutely brilliant, and it was incredibly intimidating. I am not, you know, by trade a dancer. Um, I, I have always loved to move. I love to go out and dance. I love to dance with my friends. I think it's such a great release and such yeah. an important way to like be in your body and just let everything go. But I'd never done it in my own work, and I was th I was I'm always trying to do things that make me scared. And uh, my dr I'm, you know my dream I was like dream scenario like what if Jacqueline Knight like happened to be like in New York and available like let's try like I know it's not going to happen like we're going to end up like with somebody from the theater community and that's wonderful too. And then lo and behold, he was there for the VMAs. He could give me three days, and we were in the studio together, and he put movement on me that worked for me, and it was a wonderful. Thing. And it really, it really does. All your videos do. There's a, your your videos are, are plays. They're like plays, and they're also there's a sense of um, starkness and cleanliness about them. Does that come from your vision? T uh, totally, and, and the first, I have to also attribute all of the videos leading up to Rain. Rain was directed by a fantastic guy named James Larice, but all of the other videos were directed by, like I said, my best friend Nick Lieberman, right. who is incredibly talented, and he and I share the same feeling that just because music is pop music, it doesn't mean that it has to have no context and no narrative and no emotional uh, world to live in. Right. Not that I don't love an amazing video that's just like colors and sashes, like that's amazing, um, but that's just never something I can get on board with and relate to. I can't relate to just that kind of abstract palette. I need to put the song in some sort of context. Right. Even if it's not all the way specific, Rain is like I'm on some highway at some gas station dancing in some magical convenience store and like that's fine, but there's there's some beats to it, there's some specificity to it, and I need that. But the, no. We have to wrap up, so sorry. <laughs> oh my God, that's right, yes. You have to go to Boston. I do have that's to go to Boston. That's right, I, I, I was just being selfish with my go, time. I, I have to I have tell there, everyone at Harvard to watch The Politician. Uh, yes, and, and, and you will. I have one more quick question, and yes. it's how did Jewish summer camp influence your life? Well, there's a question to end on. I mean, what a way to finish. Yeah. My mother couldn't have planned it better herself. Um, Jewish summer camp changed my life. I mean, I made beautiful friends there. It taught me to be independent away from my parents. I got to play Sky Masterson in Hebrew and Guys and Dolls. You did it in Hebrew? Hey, lady, it's nearly mazal. Hey, lady, it's nearly mazal. He matzo chereto dech lady mitna heger rock. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. This is the, the new fiddler in Yiddish is the new Guys and oh, Dolls in Hebrew. It's my number one party trick. <laughs> Well, it, it works. So that was what worked f for you. I, I, you know, I, I just have to say, I know we have to wrap up. I, I wish we could spend some more time together. Um, I'm, we'll get to. Yes, I know. I'm looking forward to that. But I just wanted to say that um, I know I, I speak for everyone in this room, and I also know that I speak for everyone at Radio City Music Hall, and the politician, and dear Evan Hansen, and. Pitch Perfect too, and merrily we roll along, and everybody whose life you have touched, you are an infinite gift, and you are the reflection of who we all would choose to be. Aww. And thank you. <laughs> <laughs>